I interrupt the crickets for this announcement. This is BTWRLM 256. That's right, that's right. Doesn't seem like you care, at least much, and some of you. We're going to do better. I mean, absolutely got to do better. Thank you for everybody who sent me emails discussing it, coming from Clint Richardson's request uh, to check out the broadcast. I do appreciate your interaction and getting stuff done. That encourages me, uh, and some of you acknowledge that it's not really that tough once you start laying it out. And I, again, have the problem of comprehensiveness of everything in life, and someone might not want it. I'd be interested in any one thing, just to get interest, to get people focused on a better path, and to protect ourselves. And you've saw, you've watched how this thing all, all rolls out. So again, thank you this last week for everybody who also uh, promoted the uh, broadcast, given that it's a promotion, shared it, whatever you want to call it. Uh, in particular, bit shoot this week. I don't know what happened, and thank you whoever was doing it to send it around. The, the numbers on that was a lot more, uh, and to show you how this um, new this new, um, if you call it the censorship thing going on, is it's coming down and being rolled out. YouTube on their RLM account, I, don't, I think we, we didn't even, I don't even think we got 15 views on the YouTube. And a place like BitChute, we got over 60, just over 60, which is actually an anomaly itself. Usually I don't do so well there. And again, at Mines, we bro- well broke over 100. So, uh, and on Mines, uh, thank you for the promotions and the helps and the bonuses there. And uh, again, I, I, I've been here 2017. Uh, appreciate all that you've been doing. Uh, and then everybody else who's just reminding, you just click a remind and it broadcasts out through your through your channels. Uh, very important. So the, this thing that's going on, whatever's happening on the internet and with all the big players and the big data and the big corporate uh, conditioning uh, that is certainly being using tools uh, that were uh, fostered, encouraged by the government if we didn't even have the uh, Vault 7 or maybe even Vault 8 WikiLeaks um, evidence, there, there is a motion going on that's going to limit the voice. So if you don't come in and, pr- and promote and help and share and identify places to be and re, what they call what, mirroring, remirror these conversations, like a normalization of ignorance, I found out, and maybe a couple of, if I don't mention you, it's just I haven't run across you. Uh, I don't, don't mean to insult anybody. I just don't know how much to talk to and who to, who's out there. I do appreciate all these surprise places that you pop up and put the broadcast, but there, there's definitely an attack. Uh, I told you I'll be in, I'll be interested to see when uh, when this broadcast go down, but uh, you know it's going to be tied to the channel, uh, the Real Liberty Media channel, and I don't know that. I think every every week now I've been told that uh, we're not being monetized on this stuff. I don't even know why we're being monetized. To tell you the truth, at one level, and then we're being restricted. So where I may get 150, 200, 300 when Vince was uh, promoting the broadcast and doing what he was doing, we're getting two and three hundred views. I'm down to 13 on YouTube. So the the, the war of, of information is on. And I uh, my whole point here is, again, even though we're reallibertymedia.com is the home base, I'm, I'm, my position is beyond the media. I, I don't want you to be locked into these divisive type ideas, getting even getting your own opinion on something to fight with anybody. I want you to understand the war that you're in, Literally, it's a war. Literally, there's no one there to help you. And uh, you better figure this out on your own and understand the terrain as it is, not as you've made up in your mind or someone's told you as it's made up. And this is an ongoing thing. The war, the war is a, this, and evolutionary engagement I put in the broadcasters is not a joke. You have to be fluid and adaptive to the things that you're around. And I'm not asking you all to go out and invent something for yourself to go fight. But you really need to look at the world. If you can't find something to be uh, not liking enough to do something about it, I don't know. I mean, it all, uh, we all have that decision to make. Uh, if you, uh, and uh, we're all in our different conditions. If you have a family that you need to prepare for, well, you're going to only be able to put in so much time if you can at that. Uh, but your families are under attack, so you better, my thought is, you better be prepared somehow. And again, thank you for, again, the emails that come in, explain your problems. But uh, I'm encouraged. You, you were able to handle, handle, handle the problem and, and then now it's looking for other ways to protect yourself that's all i'm bringing here behind the woodshed i used and i'm being told that grimner lrm is not monetized and that, that's cool but i don't know why we're being restricted as well uh, given the content uh, and i don't know i'm not into uh, really fighting it at this point and it wouldn't be my place either 
uh, these companies, to me, me uh, look like they're in violation of the Congressional Act of foreign uh, or, or, uh, propaganda organizations, and now I've identified them uh, as domestic uh, uh, propaganda organizations where uh, they actually start to censor uh, all input uh, or not thing, something that's not, not their, their belief. So there, any of you that would be interested, there's an avenue of that uh, going to go in. So you're going to necessarily have to round up the wagons Anybody who wants information, and I don't see, I don't talk left or right. I think that's the exploitation. In fact, that was just, an, just a, a, a Twitter. Uh, Kim.com mentioned something about left, right, focusing on the Fox News versus CNN. And my problem with all that is that you're, you're, you're sitting in the, uh, the left and the right don't exist. In fact, I gotta, should, should bring it up. I, I think I said, uh, all, all we're looking at is the exploitation uh, of mankind uh, with these things. And we can buy into that stuff. We can waste a lot of time in it. We can fight amongst ourselves. Or we can start understanding that there's a greater thing going on. And if you think I'm saying go in and do it the way I'm saying it, and that's what the object is, then you're missing my point too. I said, I've said over and over, this is a multidimensional battle. Some things are just to get you to get back in the game in the right way so you become effective. That's not the object. That's just the means to the end. And so some of you, again, you fight with me and you're, you argue with me or you... Whatever it is you do against me, you're you're missing the whole and entire point. I don't really care how you go about it. Just do something correct, more correct even. I don't know about correct, but more correct. You know, it's like the truth. Was it the truth uh, movement or what? It's a truthier. You know, it's a bunch of nonsense. You either better get in in and get and focus your your mind and put your own blinders on the narrow onto that narrow path. But that's a a path of of cause for you. It's a path of purpose, intention. Uh, as well, persistence. It's an endless path. It's your the end of your. It's the end of your life. I mean, when this is done, you're going to go to the bar and look at asking for a whiskey. Boy, that was a that was a hoot, wasn't it? I need a drink. I hope you I hope you end up having to think about it like that. Again, what if what if our whole ob- object here is is that we just have to fight and oppre- fight? There's we're in a, we were born into an oppression. Are we going to commit to it to be the accessory to it? Just just to subsume ourselves into it, or are we going to be the resistance of it? Are we going to help defend others that may not be able to? And we're going to do it, and my thought is, you're going to do it in very intelligent ways. You're not going to throw yourself onto the pyre and just as, say that was the option. That's never the option. Never. I don't know where that gets into people's ideas. I just go ahead and I'm going to do this just to stick it to the man. Well, you were supposed to be the man. And uh, not, no der- derogation to women. You, we didn't understand that's all there was. In fact, when you look at law, in the legal, they moved the law into legal, and then they started civilizing everything. They had to make women men. If you don't look real careful, and so women don't understand there's an insult on them at all. Uh, this is just a. I don't know how deep how to de- how deep to explain this, except for just to explain it. I, I can't prove that to you. You'll have to prove that to yourself. And I only offer things I don't, I, you know, I don't try to make the big mistake here. And I don't think I ever have. But you really, uh, when I say you have to read the black and white, I'm not joking. You have to go see it for yourself. It just happened again this weekend or this week at the association meeting. It, it's once you have the eyes to see this stuff, it just takes an instant to start picking up things. I had a, a guy hand me a letter that he'd gotten from the county, and I, I just look at the caption. I can see all the all the fraud right in the captions. Uh, his first, the two sent, first two sentences had all I needed to see between the top of the caption and the first two sentences. It's so well, less esoteric. It was a property issue, code enforcement. They admit it was your, your meaning the guy's property, your property, and yet they're they're claiming to be a development service. Now, how are, how does a county have any authority over his private property? They've admitted it's private property. What are they doing but the felony and coercion, I've told you? And so I, I outlined real quickly how he moves from the first two sentences in the first paragraph, that's all there was, two sentences, into showing how they're doing a felony and, and presenting that show cause how you're not the felon that this law says you are. You use their stuff against them. You're not entering it at all. You're not even at that point developing a status. You're actually going to eventually, if he moves farther, you're going to identify the status as a fraud that they impose upon you. Everyone's looking for a status and an identity. Stop all this, please. Stop killing yourself. And boy, am I off my tabs. <laughs> this is how it happens, folks. This is just live and uh, just in, uh, inspired to do certain things and certain thoughts come to me. 
uh, and I guess my mind goes kind of blank and I'm dealing with all the technical parts and my mind just is flooded with information, information to start to discuss, notwithstanding what I thought I was going to set up. But I can get back there soon. It's not too hard. It's all the same processes. It's fundamentally is all the same processes to get back what we were, uh, what's been stolen from us every day. And I'm only asking you to, to stand that up, stand up and, and defend yourself uh, and do it in ways that, that are a whole lot better that I see that are being done than what they are in denial. I see lots of people deny. You deny it even when you have misunderstand something. And you tell yourself you think you understand. There, There is so much to understand about this stuff. And, uh, you know, and I guess that happened this morning this, uh, in the chat room about understanding. Standing under? Well, you better decide what you will stand under. That's the first thing. And then you identify what's trying to force you to stand under. And that is all contextual. You don't just put out a blanket maxim, I don't stand under because I don't understand, and that solves it. That's never going to solve it. That's an objection you need to have an answer for. This really boils down to the rules of evidence, as it occurs to me. You want to learn how to do a lot of this? Go read the rules of evidence. And then uh, maybe even the first 10 or 15 will probably be all you actually need, although although sometimes not. And you start to analyze every, all the rule of the world, uh, the actions that come at you uh, relative to those rules of evidence, and you start understanding how to respond pretty quick. You start to understand the distinctions between what's uh, impertinent, immaterial, and, and uh, irrelevant. You start knowing when to use them. You start knowing how to identify the elements in order to see someone trying to come against you or makes a statement against you, how to tear that, tear into that and show them, and you show how they're coming uh, falsely. Never dicking on the status. Never claiming anything. Uh, throwing the statuses off, actually. And then only taking any status that is bene beneficial to you. As I've explained to other people when we talk about mining and the status of the one accepting the grant, the grantee. When you understand the law behind grants, you know that the, whoever's granting you that is a stop from interfering with you. And that happens to be the government. Now you're probably sitting in the most powerful place you can be in the fog of all the other stuff we've been told why I keep there and I explain it to people, why I keep focusing on that. If you don't focus on something that shows what you will stand under and upon, you know, you have, you're nothing. You're a ship out in the ocean without a rudder and a motor. And so it's not just about being out there uh, taking one for the team. That's the wrong way to do it. It's not out there just being adrift either. But, but it is, you, do have to plot your, you do have to plot your path. You have to have a path and you have to plot it. And if you don't, there's going to be people that are to take you down. And whether you think that backing off and doing nothing is the answer, and you tell yourself that, you're mistaken. That's all I can tell you. You may disagree with me, but that's the way this ends up working. And I've said, you, some of you may squeak out. Most of us won't. In fact, I didn't in the beginning, and that actually inspired me to continue, maybe maybe to some extra bit than maybe most people do. But here I am, and I've I've dedicated myself to do that. And I, I see the world in a whole different uh, thing. I can see the beauty in the world, but I can see what man has done to himself. And uh, as we said, uh, you're going to get on the left-right paradigm or any type of split d division. Uh, you're just being, you're just falling to be, and you don't, and there's an interesting thing. You can't be one or the other or neither. You have to take a position, but it can't be to support those three, the one, uh, the, 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 the one, the other, or the neither. The neither has in its capacity some other that's a division. You have to be outside of that and that, but you have to engage that without engaging it. It's really, there is no spoon, folks, like in the matrix. This is really a, an interesting interaction that we have to do. It's hands on, you have to get involved, but there's nothing you're touching. It, and that, that's, you're trying, that's trying to come against you is, is the ghost. It's that straw man crime against you. That I, I say, if you listen, really listen to what I'm saying and don't keep interjecting what you think and actually start listening to the point you apply what I'm saying in some small way just to get the feel for it, just to get it familiarized, just orient yourself to it. You'll understand really more of what I'm saying and that you can't take the opposition, the, the opinions, the opposition that you do without whatever I might say until you put something in practice. And, and as this is one of the, one of the themes to quite a few people I was talking about this last week, which over and it's over and over and reoccurring. It's always going to be there. Every case is different. There is no silver bullet and then there's no set up application for anybody. It's how the facts establish themselves 
and then how you apply law, whether that's against you in the moment of the imposition or how you're going to turn that around as a violation to you. So this is what I speak to behind the woodshed for anybody that hasn't heard this before. All these that have listened before, you've, you've, you understood me to talk this way. I guess this week I'm a little bit astonished a bit about how long I've been talking about perception, about how to perceive things, what's going on in the world, how to find it, how to prove it to yourself. And there's still this mentality of uh, almost denial, and then you start seeing it. And it takes such a long time. I'm, I'm dismayed at that at some level, amazed at the other, and and yet and yet here we are. Things that I've been saying for years, I hear people coming to awarenesses of in other places also. No, it does not even seemingly come from me. And I go back and say, well, I've, this is the stuff I've been talking about. I'm glad that they've come around, but, you know, look how long years and years of delay that's coming to come to the point when you finally realize the reality of the war you're sitting in. And now what do you do? It's a shock. I'm not judging any of it. I'm saying this is how we have to go. This is what you have to go through. And if you're arguing with me, you're wasting time. If you just not, don't understand what I'm saying, you think it doesn't pertain or you have a better thought, I have to say that you're wrong. And I have to say it from my research and what I do that proves that wrong. If you're, Or if you no, have no, no matter of what I do, maybe you're not in the game at all or don't intend to be. Now, that's another interesting one. We claim to be a, a, a questioning everything, claim to be knowledgeable about things, and then we really don't step forward at all. And I don't know about that one. That's a, just a difficult one. And I'm not here to force anybody, certainly. But it's always the conundrum of, are you going to step up and do something or not? I mean, are you going to accept the, the crime around it? Are you going to accept crime to happen to other people? If I, now I'll get to my tab, just on that point. Remember, I was talking about this, what, blue apron? They're going to start the USDA. The government's going to now hand people that need food a box of food. And I told you then, I told you at that point, they're going to be now giving the manufacturer, the processors, the processed food uh, that's been shown to be no good. That's the food that they're going to hand? Be the, the, you know, the, the story about the government cheese? Where do they get that plastic stuff? Well, that's what's going to be in these boxes as they claim that they're going to reduce, uh, give people more nutrition and back uh, and, and reduce costs. It's all a lie. But what we all tend to, who cares if I'm not getting that bo- blue apron box? But here, here, I want to point out something here this week. It's coming. And I always find the consistency with how this, uh, the information comes at us to, we can put it together if we want to. And whether you want to understand this for yourself or you want to understand it for somebody else, whether or not you ever get a blue apron box, whether or not they even put it out there. See, if we put it out there that we show that the blue apron box is no good for anybody or anything that looks like it, uh, and we got the evidence like I'm going to show you, and you have become vocal about it, vocal local, you can start shutting all this stuff down by your your focused energy. If you shut up or don't do another, say it's someone else's job, we all we will all perish at some well, uh, uh, perishable, because nothing in this box that's coming is going to be perishable. But as an example of how this works, they come up with the plan. Uh, they've got the outcome. Everybody think, in fact, I was just listening to this on the broadcast, uh, not before on Thursday, but before on Sunday. Uh, that they were talking about what the Hegelian dialectic, and then they go the problem, action, solution, which is the trite little point, or they go synthesis, uh, antith- antithesis, and uh, solution, whatever. Well, that's just this. That's just the idea that I tell you. There's the method that they used to under, that they've used to to take you down. I want you all instead to go look at the term praxis. This is long, long, long ancient stuff. Praxis. In fact, in fact, those of you tuning in that are from Clint Richardson, you might get interested in that. That's a, that's the utilizing the philosophies and moving, it's moving, transitioning from one point to another. And they do it right in front of you without you seeing it. That's what we're talking about. It's not really the Hegelian dialectic. That's just been the pro, that's been the promoted one so that you don't look behind it. Okay? It's always these for all false fronts, folks, is all I can tell you. You just got to look through. They're transparent to most everybody. And uh, that's what that slaps you is the ghost. The ghost slaps you, and then you, you start getting all frustrated about it instead of saying, wait a minute, here comes the ghost. This is the puff of wind. I'm just going to step aside it. Now, I'm not going to let that happen to me. But uh, here we are. We're going to promote the blue uh, apron, the blue box, the new uh, the new uh, food uh, uh, provisions the government's going to offer instead of uh, ca- the EBT card. Uh, and here's the story here. U.S. Agriculture at a glance, the USDA report. And I'm just going on a simple chart. And they show the number of farms and average farm size in the United States. And the two lines are uh, blue, number of farms, uh, and the other line is the average farm size. 
and they show that the uh, number of farms are going down dr uh, dramatically. If you, I guess 45 degree angle is pretty dramatic in my mind over time. It's a, a seven year span, and the the numbers we're dealing with are in the, the millions of farms. And at the same time that the number of farms going down, the the average size is uh, going up. Now that immediately doesn't say this on the report and on the chart, but if you read some do some research, you realize what they're doing is they're getting rid of the small farmer. Remember, I told you years ago the USDA guy I uh, don't remember his name now. Excuse me, the name's flopping around but not coming to me. But he uh, said he went to the people uh, in the middle of the Midwest and said, "You're politically inert." He told them, "You are no force and effect on what we do now." That was a couple years ago. Well, what they're doing is they're monopolizing the, uh, they're causing monopoly, uh, monopolization of the produce, food production, and they're going from uh, peop, uh, companies that own uh, larger farms and, and less of them. So those are all, again, a, a focusing point uh, that we now have a, an outcome for uh, about who's going to be providing your food and by what standard. You absolutely know that a corporate standard is going to be a corporate profit driven and not for nutrition. And they'll have all the, the the low bar. I keep telling you about the way they do this. The, the they have the low bar of, of nutrition or the whatever they deem to be uh, nutritious or whatever. They have the low bar, the the high bar of pesticide because they can pollute a little bit. They have the uh, middle military pr production uh, or, or examples and excep exceptions under Title 50 that says they can do that to you, even as an experiment. So when you start tying this together, it's not really hard to come away, come away that you're just, a, in a way, if you're not a lab rat, you're, you're certainly the, the uh, exploited, the military, uh, the, the object of the military exploitation. And the, and the bottom line of all this thing is also that it was, it was commerce driven. If you, I keep telling you all this stuff. I don't know how much it kind of sinks in. You got to put it all together. It makes perfect sense. And I say that not in absolute. Just that when you put these together, it makes perfectly se perfect sense in that category, those lists of facts. There's other ways to construct a list of facts and other facts to list in order to see a, other levels of type of oppressions or, or whatever, the methods of destruction, uh, exploitation. Again, we're all mistreat, we're just victims of the exploitation we allow. And we, when we develop these divisions amongst us, we're proof, we're showing the proof of that exploitation success. So here we have more number of farms uh, going down, the number of average farms going up. That typically, in my research, has shown the monopolization of corporate corporate uh, food processing, uh, which anybody may just readily agree to. You'd have to go search that for yourself and find the fact if you're interested. And here was the next story coming from the same website, actually. Uh, uh, now, what is this food distribution to people? When you look out around your country and you see that people, more and more people are trying to get on, uh, not ha trying to, they have to get onto subsidies. They now, I told you, the 29-hour rule, you, you're going to get part-time help and then you're going to get 29 hours. Why? Because they don't want to give you your health care. Uh, now where are you going to get your 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 money? Uh, so you can be going, I told you this was all happened years ago, I said, you're going to be wor having people, millions of people working and still have to go get so-called food stamps. Now they got this EBT condition, SNAP. Well, there's other systems that have already been in place. And in particular, there's an evidence of the of the uh, Indian reservations underneath the USDA and what happens when they get provided food. And so here we have that story, food distribution program on Indian reservations. A prototype for the harvest box? Not exactly. Now, this, this report, again, I could read this stuff. Uh, I just want to explain. I want you to read it. And on that point, thank you for the interest in the broadcaster last week where I inadvertently omitted uh, the link to the three questions I didn't read regarding the po Portland police and how I respond to that in a FOIA. Uh, I, had, uh, it, I had added that information onto my tabs. I forgot to actually include it. The request was made to do it. If those of you want to see what those three questions are in the link and what I responded in writing so you can see what that, how that looked and how really efficiently and, and short that statement was to answer those three full questions, uh, go to the blogcaster last week and go find the uh, the Portland police uh, story uh, and the FOIA. But going into here, we, we have uh, this USDA provides food under a different program to the Indians. And there's a report here you'll read uh, what they provide. And it, it, you know, it sounds all altruistic. Like, you know, I'll get to read part. The program was designed, this is the uh, Food Distribution Program on Indian Reservations. And if you listen to Walter uh, um 
excuse me, I just forgot his name, Means. I don't know why Walter popped up, but that wasn't. Russell Means, excuse me, apologize. Uh, Russell Means told us, we all, he admitted too, and found that we all live on the reservation, folks. We all live on the res. And I have I have a hard would have a hard time uh, arguing against that. So here's a, a perfect example when they uh, as they move this thing along through time and they slowly move praxis upon and through use the method of praxis to get you to realize and they realize their new paradigm for you your new rule your new existence. Uh, they they put all these things on. They sound pretty good. That this food distribution program on Indian reservations the program is designed as an alternative to SNAP for low income Native Americans living in remote areas. Without easy access to grocery stores, the food boxes delivered were filled with canned shelf-stable foods like peanut butter, canned meats and vegetables and powdered eggs and milk. Its consequences, folks, and this is where you start connecting up the monopolization of farmland, the, the integrated process of, of manufactured to processed foods, the, the, the products of which they start making sure that everyone starts to get, they create an, an economy that requires you to have to go to these places, otherwise you, you either don't eat or you starve or you just you turn yourself into the 30s in the dust bowl uh you turn out to what they uh, they planned this out like it was a natural consequence of uh, of austerity uh what's the consequence there was a high prevalence of out overweight type 2 diabetes on indian res- reservations uh, what did i tell you the weeks before and over time uh, the weeks before that all this stuff that are the reporting I report to you, the notice they tell you about what they do is meant to make you unhealthy. Well, that certainly fits into the bottom line reports I've been telling you all along. So if you don't get a handle on this, and here's the, this is a tested thing. This is not just an opinion. People that receive this kind of food turn out to even have a body shape. What they call that? It looks like commode or something. Oh, it's common bod. Commode bod. A common bod. That's even the name. There's a name for it. It's called common bod. That's what we call it because it makes you look a certain way when you eat these foods. Can't be something you should turn your gaze from. That is the program. They're they're talking now. They're letting it out that they want to put on anybody who needs help. And I'm telling you, this is including the 29-hour workers, the workers that have jobs that can't make it with their low minimum wages, notwithstanding any minimum wage, and also the amount of hours they get, as I told you, was planned coming into this since, since at least when I started broadcasting. All this was in the law coming, folks. It was all done. So here's the evidence right off the bat. You know, these food bro- uh, programs, these are monopolized to promote the bottom line of corporate-type farming processed food. High processed food in these, in these government-provided things are not healthy. Uh, and they, they have all other de- 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 delirious effects. Uh, I can't remember now. Oh, yeah, here it is. I'm trying to just roll through half. I'll just read it. Culturally inappropriate food. Poor quality, ultimately. In, just notwithstanding their claim of nutrition. Uh, induced dependency. Would you think of that, folks? This is how they do this. They induce the dependency by your, by push, pushing you into this. Undermine traditional diets. Which, uh, folks, we've made it all the way to here on traditional diets. Why would we think the government can provide it better in a box? Uh, part of barter trade economy, unwanted items are bartered, traded, and sold as fed, or fed to pets. So it doesn't even really reach the point. Besides, you're going to you, how are you going to afford the dog food? You're you're needing assistance in food. You're going to have to feed your pet anyway. Well, this is the unwanted stuff. So they they give you unwanted things, which is certainly part of that list. So when I'm talking about this. Uh, for, for you all, and you don't get SNAP, or you have a nice job, and you've got lots of time, and maybe you get full time, and you get health benefits, I want you to consider that there's a whole bunch of gob of people out there that don't have any of that, and they are we're slowly being changed, our society is being altered to have to take on this thing, and this thing is planned for a consistent de- de- a degradation of the people around you. And when they, and I just want to point out to those of you who may be better off with that, may not think it affects you, when you get people down into uh, that point, uh, then uh, you have more problems in society. Government will be there, and it will claim to solve it, but all that was done, it's the ripple effect. It ends up coming out of your pocket and out of your servitude to more regulation. And then the fear that if they're not there to protect you because you think that that's their duty, uh, then you're going to be in trouble. And they get any more leverage. They do that all in the West. They, the sheriff's office, oh, we got no money to protect you. And all the old folks say, oh, oh, I need to have you protect me. 
but there's no duty in it. So here's the, you, we, I just, to me, it's just, um, again, it, it's just the trick they pull. It's the trick they pull that everybody, uh, that everybody uses. The same thing they call these boxes nutritious. The evidence shows counter. No one goes and speaks about this in any forceful way or moves the remedy past the, the objection when it's ignored by the agency. Uh, and you get these kinds of decisions. But here's the, the fact that I've been telling you, if you start working this right, no matter what the subject matter area is for you, and I was t- hitting the 420 crowd for the DEA, the Cray Tom people, if you want to think, protect your, D- your, your marijuana, which you haven't done, you maybe go protect the Cray Tom it, since you didn't get in on, on the, on the, on the, on the, on the cannabis thing. The Cray Tom needs some help. Well, somebody did what I was saying. I didn't contact them. They were doing this on their own. I want to just point out somewhere out there, someone understands how this works. And here is part of the story. Court decision could lead to EPA banning flor- water fluoridation. Big headline here, EPA is national, banning water fluoridation from a court decision. All right, so someone went in and understood that these acts of Congress mean something, and in this act of con- Congress called the Toxic Substance Control Act, there's a provision for people to make the, the agencies look at particular things uh, for their safety, certainly, within, again, the police powers of the federal government. And understand this water is... This distribution of water is a commerce thing. Whether or not the EPA is, is a, is actually constitutional, the, you understand your water supply is now in commerce here. And so this, a federal court has denied an attempt by the Environmental Prote- uh, Protection Agency to dismiss a lawsuit seeking a ban to use, to the use of fluoride under the Toxic Substance Control Act. What they did, they did it, they did not and ignored a petition to counter that. Of all the years I've been talking, how many of my listeners have put a petition before the EPA to stop the fluoride they know is poisoning people? As all the listeners that had that as a thing in their craw that were useless to everybody. I don't mean to insult anybody. I'm just telling you this is how this works. That they've been doing fluoride and there was a method that you could go in and you could bring this about if you were interested enough more than just whining about it. To bring it up as a question. And whether or not I actually like these people, because I haven't researched them, but these guys with these names are really troubling, Water Watch Incorporated, uh, they brought a lawsuit, and they challenged the EPA's failure underneath that act in order to look at fluoride. So here we also see the admission that the government does not work for you, doesn't work out to be for, for you, it works out to sell another product to the water distribution systems that they don't care that it harms you. In fact, it harms you in a way that advances their uh, governmental cause, doesn't it? And so, again, Title 50 is right here in my mind. Uh, I've asked, I was asked to, uh, someone asked me in order to uh, go through it, I've asked you to go look, go read it yourself. Don't read very carefully for the exceptions of the government being able to hurt you. If you don't want to be doing the reading, uh, Clint Richardson did, I think it's lethal injection, about 20 minutes in. He reads at Title 50 and explains to you how these vaccines and things uh, are are imposed upon people if you don't have a better word in your mouth, as I've been saying all these years. So here's a point where the government's not going to help protect you, resistant to protecting you. If you didn't take that as a notice, I don't know what to say, but there was a remedy. Now, I don't know where this is going to end up. I'm just saying if I think that if we had a lot more people that got more than shooting off their mouth about what they don't like, they actually looked at where they could enter in on these even narrow points and made a case, made the record, made it noticed to people. I don't know how this affects people. When I read the title, a court decision could lead to the EPA banning water fluoridation. Those of you that know fluoride, you can't think this is a small title to a story. And I'm asking you all, for those that were really into not wanting your little ones to be destroyed by fluoridation, where were you that you didn't bring this up? Especially those that have been listening, listening to me. Now, I've told you a long time ago, and I don't mean this in any judgmental way. It's just going to be the fact. Between friends, I'm condemning you all. I'm condemning all of you. And, and that's just the way this is going to work. And I still love y'all. Because this is just us. And we're handed all the tools if we know where to find them and we don't help ourselves. That's a, fa- a frailty in us. That's being exploited. 
And that's why I say that's on us. I've always said this. Again, uh, I can point out, I can point at all the other things. I can call them all kinds of names and I can do all kinds of things. But remember, those three pictures, those fingers pointing back. So, behind what you had, uh, we get the lickings here, what you should have done that you didn't do, given you think you want to make the claim that you were against fluoridated water. And you see, there is a response from the system. This wasn't even doing all the challenges that I wouldn't allow in myself, but this is even going within the system of it. Where this turns out, we'll see. Because remember, this is not much different than to me than DAPL and all the other administrative impositions that have points of uh, uh, remedies for challenge. It's not that hard. And in fact, uh, one of the emailers said, you know, this stuff really isn't that hard to understand. It's just taking the time to look at it. And then uh, my addition would be, yeah, that's right, and then implementing it properly. And it's not a lot of work in some regard. It's really just, it's kind of like the uh, parry uh, in, in fighting, in, in, in sword play or something. You don't really fight. You, you just set it up to where you step aside and there's nothing there for it. You're not standing there when they come down with the sword. It's a different, like Aikido, you, they come at you, you do your, you do your, you do your jujitsu on them and then they're on the ground. And as I showed the guy the, this uh, in the association meeting, uh, a property owner, I, I, it was not, um, took longer to explain it than to see it. Within three steps, the, we had the guy uh, who had sent the letter from the government, we had them, him having to answer to two felonies, as I keep telling you. It's all the same stuff. And I didn't even get to all the status stuff. See, status may be irrelevant. You don't have to put that on you to answer. As I told another guy, I said, why are you putting all these statuses on you when you're innocent of all of them? There's a whole different thought process in my mind that's going on that I see most anybody uh, uh, discussing in the chats or with me uh, that I try to try. I'm hoping I eventually will convey to most people, listen to what I'm saying. Uh, again, it's not my my research and my judgments are not to replace your own. I'm saying if you don't begin at least where I'm I'm providing experiential observations to you, you're probably wasting a whole lot of time. I guess maybe I should just put it that way. You're just probably wasting just a ton of time. And if you're not doing that, you're not doing anything. I mean, I don't know what to say to, more to that. That's uh, that's the beginning and the end of uh, your so-called journey. You haven't taken the first step. And yet, maybe someday in the future you're, you're oppressed and didn't get geared up. You weren't trained. You didn't train yourself for this. Not that you're looking to uh, to invoke it. You just want to be prepared. Or you were in something and then you did it all wrong. And then as, as I, I tend to get the last, uh, as the last guy I was talking to, well, we're at the two, two inch line on, uh, on uh, our own, uh, on our, our own uh, goal line. Uh, what do I do? That, that's when I get them. Boy, that's difficult. And I look at it and say, okay, we, we're going to make a touchdown on the next play. They're not going to get it. They're not going to get the two points and they're not going to move the ball for their six points on the two inch line, folks. And I don't do Hail Marys. Well, no, I might make it look like a Hail Mary, but you're going to find out if you're messing with me that it wasn't. And so this is all part of the battle. But I don't give up because it's an ultimate crime against all of us. And when we start to see that crime, it doesn't matter if I'm on the last, last half inch line. There's a crime against you. You just have to quickly get it moved out into the record and move it along. And that gets you running down the trail again, or it's a big pass. It's a pass to a, it's a, pass to a target that's going to make the score. And so that my, what I'm telling you is all uh, multidimensional issues of, based in, it's a, conditioned by your ignorance of those other levels and a, a future action. As I was talking to someone, oh, it was the same gentleman in the association. He was, he was talking about uh, these things and these steps. And I said, well, okay, so I, what I've offered you eliminates everything you've said. And I'm already talking to you about an, if, it, if they ignore all this at the lower, at the state level, I'm talking about your your appeal. I'm setting up your appeal with what you're doing today. And so there's this other lack of awareness in people that I see very clearly that needs to be done. It's not that much more work, actually. It's just a part and parcel of the thought process, the reasoning behind how you approach someone who's coming to, art, to attack you. And literally that it requires the evidence to counter it, whether that evidence is the law, the printed the printed objective basis, the law, whatever you call it, it's the rule, the code, the statute, whatever you call it, the thing that the other side, whoever the imposer is, has to follow. You put that up against them as a violation, and all of a sudden you've got the table starting to turn. And what they'll do is they'll try to do all the evasion, uh, evasion, and uh, they'll try to duck and uh, duck and cover, and you're just, you're, your job is to not let that happen. So here's the, here's the condition 
where the government is, uh, again, I think this is an evidence. You, I would use this. I would put this in my bag of proof. The EPA isn't concerned uh, to do what's right uh, or to even entertain what might be better. And apparently it was properly argued that a court is going to confirm that. And uh, we may, on a national level, not have the uh, standard of fluoridation that has hap- that is, has been that we've suffered with as a people and how untold harm that's been put on it when it does get relieved. That nobody listening to me couldn't have been the one that started this or it jumped in to help these people otherwise. So more things coming about our life and the bottom line is really not about you and they really don't care. And I told you, be careful of this uh, situation with your your data. And just a quick st- quick statement. Another 2.4 million Equifax consumers have data stolen in the massive leak. Again, these, this is a U.S. consumers thing. The United States, suppose, it tells you because it's a commerce thing, it's supposed to sit there to protect you. But, but they lied to you when they told you even 140-something million got, got whacked for this. There was even 2.4 million more. So this is, when this, when these problems, economic and digital problems happen, they're as comprehensive as the EPA wrongly imposing fluoridation and not caring. They don't care. And that, that should be, a, that should terrorize everybody at some point. The, the government doesn't really care. The government is not there to protect you. I don't know why this is so hard for people to truly, truly, truly deeply understand and why it takes so long for people to understand that. And I guess what I started to focus on this week was some acknowledgments of the fact that people starting to see this whole point. I, I don't know where, you know, I'm just dismayed. I've been talking about this for years and years and years. And nobody refers to what I've been saying. Nor did they do the study, and all of a sudden one day somewhere else they hear, oh, this is not the, what you thought was right ain't. How many times, how many d- d- titles have I done what you thought that wasn't, that was so that wasn't? What you thought that was the right thing to do that isn't? So, along with this digital data things and these leaks and all this other stuff, I've uh, been uh, moving on a little bit about what we thought about being protected. Uh, and when we go on this, on this uh, inter- information highway, Okay, so if it's a highway, it's a franchise, and its systems are sitting in a franchise of another highway that was the people's creation for the people's utility, and I think there's the avenue there to get into these companies, notwithstanding their private nature when they're violating everybody. But how you tra- go through the Internet, you want to do it sound of anom- an- anonymous, and I've said that the Tor browser has been avail- avail- available to us. There was a little report that pops up. Someone did some research. Uh, interesting uh, disclosure has been found, and a lot of documents you can download for those of you that are interested. What was interesting is what wasn't actually found, notwithstanding everything that was found. Uh, but if you want to go the so-called uh, anonymously, I told you, be careful. It's pseudo-anonymity, so be careful on all this. They're telling us that. Uh, but it was uh, it was shown that the people who are developing the tour are actually getting paid by the United States government in the documents. I have not gone through the files. I don't have the time. It's not an interest of mine at this point, uh, although I do use the tour browser. I use it for things, and I, since I'm not a criminal, I don't care. I'm just using it to prove that I was trying to be anonymous because there's a defense about that. If they ever wanted to fabricate, like they're doing right now at YouTube, fabricate that what you're saying is disinformation, defaming you as well on the YouTubes and wherever, on Twitter, wherever they are, to shadow ban us. Uh, the, this becomes uh, that it's a, it's a silent defense that's being built in just by using it, uh, that you can then pr- prove other things out if it ever comes to pass. So I don't do this because I think so. I do this in the eventuality it might. Now, it's not the only browser I use, but it's important because I do use it. Well, so you, And if you use it, you should be concerned about this, but also look at the limitations of what you can use on it. Is we're going to need to stay on this Internet for a long time. Uh, this is why you need to support the network. And I don't know. I haven't talked with Grimner. If we broke it last week, uh, maybe, again, donate to the donate to the, the, the reallibertymedia.com a couple dollars. If you got got 100, fine. If you got five, fine. Whatever you can do, keep the servers running. Again, um, I'm kind of extending what even Grimner what was asking for. We usually just do February, but I just realized that you know, if you, with all this stuff being sh- we're being foreclosed from, uh, those of you that want to hear our voices, uh, the hosts' voices on the networks that you do, you're going to have to transfer your indignation for some cash, at least for the hardware, if not for the help that comes in the volunteers to keep it going, uh, and that's to the to the networks that you listen to. Uh, but so the tour became a question with this investigator. Someone dedicated his time to find and ferret this out. And he got to, has a monstrous uh, uh, document uh, d- dump he put on, not on WikiLeaks. But here's a while the documents 
uh, the documents uh, do not show Tor employees was a comment out of one of his uh, his web pages. While the documents do not show that Tor employees provided backdoors into their software, they do reveal that they have no qualms with privately tipping off federal government to security vulnerabilities before alerting the public. It was probably the most astonishing thing to hear at the level of the balance between is, are they are they providing backdoors or not? Well, in the communication. These are FOIA communications between the people that are making, doing tour and the government. There was no evidence that they were actually advancing the, telling anybody that there was backdoors to exploit. Other, other than what you just heard here, the comment that they would find themselves would find vulnerabilities and then let the government know. So that's the venue, that's the uh, tool you're using, that's the vulnerabilities of it, and use that with a, a caution. But this is how, uh, again, the frailty of our digital world and the frailty of the, uh, what, again, the silent weapon of quiet war digital system that they want you to plug into, uh, and uh, you do, you will. I just, you, do, you will. So, uh, again, uh, how much you want to agree with that and disagree, it's up to, not up to me. That's going to be your downfall if you disagree with me about, not just not using the product or deciding to use it. It's it's understanding the plague, the game that you were in. This matrix, literally, this program that seems to be running. I don't want to necessarily go to the point that I don't think it's real. What I'm saying is that these are the analogs, uh, the, the this fairy tale analogs we're told to let us know that there's something out there. And essentially, you can't ever be told that uh, you can't ever have the complaint you were never told. And that's partly my point. Listen, behind the woodshed, I'm condemning you. You can say you're not hearing it. You can claim you heard it later or somewhere else. The point is that you heard it, and then you didn't respond to it. And I'm only doing it not to force you to do anything. I'm saying there's an enemy out there that you, not not to blow this up. If there isn't one, that's fine. But for the most part, people are having troubles. Whether you want to help, just help them as a good Samaritan or yourself and prepare for an eventual thing, that is required. At some point, that's going that is required. If you have any compassion or empathy, if you don't, then I'm, you're just another psychopath as far as I can tell. So I don't know. I don't know about that part. I'm not making that judgment. You are, you're not. That's all. I mean, it doesn't, it begins and ends there. So digital weaknesses, the, uh, the, the hacking, even the Tor browser, we talked about all this is to be careful on, on using it. Don't think you're going to use it like it's some protection. Just use it to produce the evidence that you intended it to be private. That'd be probably the most I'd be using it for. I have a, a link to these documents. Uh, I don't know. I think if I remember right, the numbers are a couple thousand. When you go through all the links, you can download them um, and, and read them yourself if you're interested. Uh, there's uh, the communications between uh, between the government and Tor, uh, Tor, uh, 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 Tor uh, programmers uh, through a FOIA request, folks. This is the other thing. This is a, everything's in our hands if we were just to step up and, and take it. Instead of pointing our fingers at it, we use those same hands to do something. Uh, quit being idle about, about it and, and do something. It's all, all I'm looking at doing here is just to try to get you to interested in doing something. And some of you are, are already under the gun, and you, it's tough. But uh, you're we, again, I just read how you guys work it out. Who you, whoever you are, you write to me, and I read how you work it out. And you did work it out, didn't you? Take that as a lesson. I mean, that's a big one right there. You, you worked it out. However you worked it out. I would just ask, listen to what I've been saying, and you'll notice within that what you did, either by plan or by accident, You'll see within what I'm saying, you did that to be successful. And you did other things, I'm sure. That's not the limit of it. But you eventually had to go through a couple-step process of identifying the wrong, of finding out that knowing it was wrong was the first thing, setting up the word in your mouth before they made you go do it wrong or force you to do it wrong. Uh, then you identify the wrong, and then you identify how that wrong was had an objective basis in showing there was supposed to be a, a limitation in law with regard to accountability. You identified that. And then you file that notice of all that's going on. You essentially did a pre-claim right there of a lawsuit. You start doing that, and uh, those of you that I can read through your stuff, you did that, whether you know this or not. And it wasn't that hard, actually, and you're just fighting just fighting the oppression. And it's overwhelming at the time, but you become successful, and you're just looking at the method. You go already got it. It just The difference, the only distinction about that, and anything else is the subject matter of, and who might come against you and their willfulness against you to be the criminal. And that's, there's nothing I could say more to that than you just have to be more on it. So what's, what about this, the digital the non-anonymity conditioning, the looking in, the so-called hacking, which 
may not be a back door, but is uh, really an advanced notice of a vulnerability that's exploited. Again, all this is exploitation, folks. It's just exploitation. It's like human trafficking. I don't care where you look at it. This is what the government is, the bottom line, and for all kinds of reasons. But we have a, a report here that YouTube secretly using the SPLC to police videos. Uh, Southern, uh, SPLC is the Southern Poverty Law Center. And so they're supposed to be the conscience of the world now and the government and the YouTube. And I found this to be a pretty interesting story. You may need to read why, uh, how this is coming down in YouTube and other, do tub, yeah. And others, I don't know why it's not called the boob tube right now. It's just like the other one that we don't watch anymore. Uh, but anyway, YouTube is getting help from the left wing, uh, Southern Poverty Law Center in an effort to identify extremist content. So I go through and read all this stuff, and those of you that have had your channels taken down uh, or, or threatened, or like we are now seeing, we're not cut off at Real Liberty Media YouTube. We're just not getting promoted. We're, we're not. We're getting restricted. Uh, we're not getting uh, the coverage. Actually, everybody who mirrors our stuff is actually getting more coverage than the network itself website account or the YouTube account. But they're using apparently this uh, SPLC's uh, manpower, if you will, woman power, whoever it is, interference power. And they're in league now with this group, the left-wing nonprofit, which has uh, most recently come under fire for labeling legitimate conservative organizations as hate groups, is one of the more 100, one of more than 100 non-governmental organizations and government agencies in YouTube's Trusted Flaggers program. A source with knowledge of the arrangement told the DC, it was the the Daily Caller. So here you see the word NGO, folks. You don't become an NGO without being aligned with the United Nations. Now we can go off on uh, who these people are. If you go and look at their history, they've been pretty solid in uh, going after uh, certain types of law cases, and that's why they got their notoriety. Uh, but my view on this, and uh, certainly if they're uh, making their their promotion, their their guidance, their policy for their rulemaking and how they implement this is take has been uh, taken and honored by its implementation by YouTube. We now have a not just, it's not beyond conspiracy. We have this collusion. So what you have to now look for is what that, where the Achilles heel of the collusion is, and we see it in the uh, organization deeming hate groups. Hate groups would have a definition. So I went really quickly just to kind of blow this through. Just want to see what, what what would I find if I wanted to address this problem, not against the SPLC, but against the uh, the the private businesses, which everyone wants a private business. They get to say so. That's true. I've said that myself. But when they disclose a certain thing, make a condition that they violate, and then as I would tie it together, being on the public franchise of the utility, being able to use the phone system, the backbone, which is on the on the public utility, you start to connect these up, we may have a lot stronger uh, issue to address those that might want to. That My observation when I went and looked around with the SPLC and their claim, uh, in the story that, connect, that I have a link to, it says SPL's claim to objectivity is nothing less than fraudulent. So you realize that when I was reading the, art, the article, I saw the hate groups, and hate groups is pretty neutral. I mean, you know, there's really no definition. It's, it's ambiguous. It's a, a, an abstraction. It's, it's uh, arbitrary and capricious. What can I say? It's just not really a def It's just an unusable word. Uh, it's all subjective, certainly. And so here it is, right? In, this, in the story, I find this little section that there's other people that are uh, claim that uh, objectively is nothing less than fraudulent, their claims. And then I looked and went and do research what they said. What it turns out to be is this little phrase, and I put this in a Twitter. You get the link if you want to see it. And my question to the poster before me, or, or actually I, uh, in, in a condition of, of everyone was kind of talking to, uh, to this, and I just twit, uh, put a Twitter out of this, said, and I said this, about this problem with the um, arbitrary and capricious title of a hate group, uh, my question and you know my questions are rhetorical. They actually have the answer within the frame of the sentence of the question. So how, my question, how are YouTube and Google not a domestic disinformation operation having, quote, beliefs or practices that attack or malign an entire class of people typical for their immutable characteristics? Close quote. Where did I get this quote? But at the SPLC's website as their definition is the very same thing the SPLC and YouTube and Google are doing to those that can identify their immutable characteristics. And so my 
if, if you will, you just listen to what I'm saying on the Twitter, not all the time, it just information sometimes goes out, but in this particular case, I was putting the seed of a, con the, the beginnings, the seed of the germ for how this would, how you would start to begin to address this problem, and at least start throwing it out there that there's a, that this one-sided thing they're doing, notwithstanding the private nature of it, truly is baseless and it's, it starts to become criminal when you turn that hate group by that de their own definition into a defamation. And you're harmed by all the content being brought down, your, the speech that's now mischaracterized and mistreated unequally. And also, I haven't know, know if people are understanding this. They threatened to take down, I guess, Alex Jones's uh, website. I don't know how much a hype that was. Twitter came right back, in, or excuse me, YouTube came back. We're not intending to do that. But it occurred to me when they said 33,000 videos would be pulled down all the time that, that would be stolen in building upon the, upon the representation by YouTube that you would have a place, all the time that may be able to be claimed by anybody wanting to try uh, for the amount of time that's been that's deleted contrary to their representation based on this statement that actually is a standard that is applicable again to even you being censored. And if you start to understand how this works, I think you start to see a better path uh, more clearly on how you start to address what seems to be just one massive victimhood as I see this. Uh, people just uh, just accepting that's the way that, that that's all there is. It's it's inspired the alternatives of the alternatives. In other words, I you know I, I have to look for them myself. That's why uh, again, free and slave said, so "Well, why don't you just get over to Minds.com and preserve the name?" Okay, I'll do it for that reason. Well, it's turning out Minds.com is a place that people want to hear the stuff. That's great, and it's an alternative. If YouTube goes down, we can at least fire find ourselves there. RLM, Real Liberty Media. You don't think that's valuable? Wait till YouTube shuts down the access. Real Liberty Media is going to be the only portal at that point. So consider how these things, what you support, what you don't, what you're silent on, and what, what you move on. I think you can use their own words against them. I think that uh, we can explain uh, the weapons that are being used, that they all are hackable. And so this is the world we live in. But it, the fact that we're in, a, in this divisive nature, we're in a world of war. I don't care how you define it. I don't care if you call it left, right. I don't, well, I don't even know. I don't even have the titles in my mind. I, I keep going. All these, uh, everyone has all these titles. They can go through a whole list of all the different types of uh, divisions. I, I don't really have them in my mind. They're just, uh, they're, a, they're just an obstruction. I just don't even want to look at it. I know they're there. We're going to attack. We're going to attack the problem. And this is all done because that that division is a weapon. Uh, that division is a weapon, no different than the social media is a weapon. Everything you can see, the straw man is a weapon. Do you know how to use it, folks? Do you know that's what I'm trying to show you that they're taking to take this away. You make an alternative, and if anybody you, you want to make a point, you slow down on what's going on. You look at the issue, and you take it to task. That's how this game starts to be played when you're trying to get wrestle your own countries back into some measure of stability. Because the whole matter is to make it instable and in, empower the one who's wielding the power behind the scenes. You know, I don't even call it deep state. It's so beyond that, it's not even funny. So we're told a lot of things. The government's not there to help you. I've showed you the evidence of it today. Uh, we keep plugging into all this stuff. We keep relying on what we're told. The truth keeps coming out over time about how all our, our, our perceptions are, are incorrect. I've been on record for years to try and show you how those perceptions um, at least the ones I hear generally are incorrect, how to rethink about what's going on. I've been a proponent of the fact that you live in a w war of the worlds is not a joke. Uh, this is the war of our world, and it's what we were born into. And every evidence is there to tell us that. Every evidence is there to be discussed. And I find it fascinating people are discussing it, and it's all coming back to what I've been talking about, but more importantly, what I saw back in the 90s. And I didn't see it in the 90s because it just started. That was what we started to do. This is about before, like right at the time the Internet started getting legs. I didn't even have access to it. I was still the old school. You have to go to a library to go read this stuff. In fact, my my my, my research for international law, Benedict's on Admiralty, was me walking down to a university uh, university law school librarian, got in the basement and started reading 
excuse me, that 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 Benedict's and Madam was up in the in the top. And then I went down. Once I read that, then I went down into the basement where the interesting documents are. And so this is all reading from real time, not not the internet stuff. But here we have. I want to point out something uh, to you all about how this all in one category of facts that you establish, you proof it out. You can see what I've been saying that the military consequence of our life. Uh, proven out over and over that they use the, these rules. The government is the tool of exploitation. And you can remain quiet on it or you can engage it and see what you can do in order to slow it up and get more people to understand uh, the dynamic of the oppression so that more and more people start working on it and it goes quicker and quicker as opposed to what my experience has been 30 years of hardly anybody understanding a damn thing and uh, in particular going into mining law and having the majority of the miners n not understand or actually fight us, uh, get mad at us for what we've produced over the last at least uh, eight years, uh, seven, eight years. Uh, it's really a phenomenon. I told you the microcosm of the minor is the macrocosm we know as America or any other nation of people. We, we are just our creatures of our frailties. It's pretty pretty fascinating. Now, I really don't, like I said, I don't have any judgment on it. That's just who we are, how we respond. We respond through those. Those are That's another sense of us that we respond through, another filter like our eyes, our sense of touch, taste, smell. Whatever. Our thought. Thought is a big one. But uh, here here we have more and more evidence, folks. I want to just uh, go through this. Armed and dangerous. If police don't have to protect the public, what good are they? Uh, very fascinating to me. And dismay almost that uh, someone's coming up. He's a, this is written by John Whitehead. I have a lot of uh, general um, agreement with John Whitehead. What I don't have is he's an attorney. Uh, and not that he's just the attorney, but you would have thought that this would have come out before or he would have more of the remedies available that he doesn't, uh, that we could be empowered by how to take action. And maybe I'm looking at that because I don't, this is just water under the bridge for me. And I was a little astonished to hear, and no judgment again. I don't want, I don't want to have anybody think I'm picking on anybody who sounds like it's familiar to them. This is just the reality of how I hear. The realization that the gut police don't have the pro have have to protect the public. Well, actually, they have to protect the public. It's even the wrong title. They don't have to protect you. And hearing people, it's all at the same time. What's interesting too, all coming to that realization for true. I didn't really realize that. I didn't really, really, really believe that. Oh, I'm just realizing that is the truth. I've told you this forever. I've been ever able to do this. I've told it before I was on the internet. This was told to me and by others that had done research before me back in the middle 90s. Why? It's like this 30-year itch that comes around. All of a sudden, we're going to make a big promotion of it. My problem is those promotions end up going water under the bridge back into the memory hole. I want you all that are coming to terms, whether you end up thought, thinking you heard it from me or not, and you think you hear it from somewhere else, uh, let me let me focus on this for today. That the police don't have a have the duty to protect you. They have to protect the public, but the public is the government. When you understand how to read these words, so John Whitehead's discussion I would have issue with at that point, but not to argue with him. He's pointing out something. I don't know where everyone's getting their information now that they're finally realizing this is a fact, but I want to go through this whole point. You have to get this, and I want you to understand it in the context of the military consequence as well. Why you see the EPA res res reticent to move forward to not poison you and put you in a mental state by the chemical they put in? Why the pharmaceuticals are there? Why this oppression? Why you're shot on sight anymore? As I told you, it was coming. With no remedy is the other thing. That's the killer one for me. I want to I want to point out a couple things that may be missed in these discussions. But let me go through here a little bit. John Whitehead does a good article here. I don't want to condemn all that part. I just think it falls way short when it's already known. This is not even not even a question. And there's no relationship back before the fact of like the Internet time. It's like, this is like the Internet generation. It's just since 2005. Like that's when the world started. And I guess it's a little bit of a gripe for me. You all think this is information just now coming out or you just start, you don't listen to me. You listen but you don't actually agree with me. You don't actually believe what I'm telling you is the fact. And why I come to my conclusions, what I do and how I approach certain things is because this stuff is the fact. It's not just a fairy tale. The direness of the condition. 
We are so inculcated with what we were told. We have all, we don't, I'll just have to say it this way, you don't even know what critical thinking is. You do not know what critical thinking is. You have no way to reason it. And so I'm glad that people are coming onto the, onto the idea and I find, again, I, I always find it amazing. I see like handfuls of people coming to the same relation at the same time. It's like the hundredth monkey issue, but so late in the game, it seems. But thankful it's happening anyway. Uh, police don't have a protect, police don't have to protect you. Now, I'll say that. It's, oh yeah, I know that. I don't know the cops and don't call the cops, all that. So I'm not talking about all that stuff. I'm talking about the foundation of this and why this is the fact and how it ties into everything I've been telling you that you really need to take seriously. You need to listen to what I'm saying. You can't let this stuff go for years by thinking, oh, that guy sounds okay, but I don't quite really get that. I don't quite, it doesn't impress me. You need to make this impressionable for yourself. That's the other thing they've done to us. You get, you get, we all get impressioned about things that are divisive, not things that would integrate uh, your knowledge in yourself in order to start looking at the world, provide a basis to start critically thinking. He goes on, American police state. I've told you this is not the police, folks. This is a military state. And this is what I don't like about some of John Whitehead's stuff. It's like, it's diminutive of the actual condition. And the condition is the effect. It's not the cause either. And I'm not talking the esoteric ideas about what might be causing society to be where it is. It's been a plan, and I've told you that plan is our problem. And unless we develop the idea and see, bring apparent, not transparent, but bring it into view, this problem that we have to deal with, or this plan that we have, that we have to deal with, we're not going to address that problem. So he says, in the American police state, this police has a, a tendency to shoot first and ask, questions later. In fact, police don't usually need much incentive to shoot and kill members of the public. And my point is it has nothing to do with incentive. It has to do with the way they actually know they're there. Like when I hear a government meeting, a county meeting, and, they, and, the, and the PETA gallery says, but you work for us, so I pay your, I, I, my taxes pay for your position, and a, count, a, a, council, a um, committee, um, what is it, county commissioner will tell them, no, I don't. And then the peanut gallery goes, goes in a big uproar. They've heard the truth, and they don't quite get it. That's what I don't like about this. Uh, we, we are told different terms for what's actually going on. It softens the blow. It's not as deep as it needs to be. They don't come at you just to kill you without incentive. There's a purpose behind their ability to think they can. It's the system that provides that insight to them, and it's your inaction to control it on the other side. And given that condition, it dictates how. You want to be told about how you don't want to do something? This is dictating to your life, and you don't even rec recognize it. The police have shot and killed Americans of all ages, many of them unarmed. Many of them unarmed. For standing in a, a certain way, moving a certain way, holding something, anything that police could misinterpret to be a gun, uh, or igniting some trigger-centric fear in the cop police officer's mind that has nothing to do with the actual threat or safety. Haven't I told you all that paragraph, folks? Years and years and years. It's like it comes back and it's being regurgitated to tell you again through John Whitehead. There it is. And he goes on to tell you and explain to you in references the latest, which I thought was interesting. Now, before uh, your outrage bubbles over because uh, all these people are dying at the hands of the cops, Consider the United States Supreme Court has repeatedly affirmed, parenthetically, most recently in 2005, that police have no constitutional duty to protect members of the public from harm. Police have no constitutional duty to protect the members of the public from harm. What have I told you before? The protect and serve is to protect and serve the public, which is the government. Now, protect and serve, the word is service, Protected to serve you up into the process of that system is what you're looking at in those statements. Community service is the community, not you. They're telling you the fact of this. This is long. He comes at 2005 like that's the beginning and the end of the universe. This is a long-standing trail of cases that I want you to be aware of that we are completely oblivious to. When I'm telling you you live in a military consequences, this is no joke. You go read that Libra code, and you start understanding this is the truth. 
that the Supreme Court, the gov- the judicial de- department branch of the government of the United States says there is no duty in the cops to protect you. And then I want you to go consider the Libra Code. Who are they to protect? They secure their some themselves, don't they? So this word secure pops up pretty quick, and that's what you see, the government and the state government, they all do this security stuff, don't they? But they're securing themselves. This is where I get this stuff. Not this guy's article. Not from 2005. This is something I've been writing about, I had written about when I was writing, since back in the middle 90s. And it's before that I just said. And I wanted to also point out again, this has to do with that creation of the United States itself. That when you look at the political jurisdiction that it was created under, that that's essentially the commerce, certainly after the peace treaty. The Treaty of Peace, that was a commerce compact at some level. It was. I, mean, I don't know what else to say about that. It was a treaty, too. Prior engagements entered into, shall this constitution be subject to? Okay, it's all written out if we just look at it. This becomes the basis for what you're seeing now. Because the military protects the bottom line. Right? It's commerce construction. And I want to put, as I say that, I'm going to give the caveat. In the set of facts that I can present to you, that's the thought and the proof. Set up a different way, we come up to a different type of oppression cause. Each one, depending on how it comes at you, will be how is the is the lineage, the path you try to go attack it back through. So John Whitehead comes out and tells you again, there's no police. I'm surprised that this thing kind of blew up lately. A lot of people are now taking notice. I don't know what happened when I said it. And this is the kind of interesting thing I, I laugh about a little bit. It's kind of a sad laugh that I, where, why do, what do I, what do I sound like that no one actually listens to me? Actually, I mean, really listens to me. What is in our minds that we don't listen to this important stuff and we won't actually dig in, roll up our sleeves like I say we have to do and go find out the fact of this? That when I hear lots of people coming down and saying, oh man, there's a, now I'm seeing it. I'm finally seeing it. I'm, I'm elated that you're seeing it. I'm disappointed. That you didn't see it, what, nine years ago when I started talking about it. Again, those of you that have listened to me this long. So, he's writing about this thing. I'm telling you it's not the police state. It's a military state. Every evidence does it uh, shows that it is. Uh, they want to say that they want to, you see that propaganda of the United States pre- presenting the Constitution as something to be secure by utilizing the cops in America, and then you see them roll out the military to support them, uh, and then you g- feed into the, conse- the, the concept that uh, the police are heroes. Now, anybody listening on this broadcast that has been you know, conducive and the and the, the the religion of RLM, I'm singing to the choir, you already uh, think you know this stuff. And that's the, your attitude about it. Just out of turn, you just say, yeah, they're, cro- they're, they're crooks. They're, they're killers. Stay away from them. Don't call them. All that. I'm not talking about those obvious responses. I'm talking about getting the deeper understanding and start to work from there. Not be surprised. Not come to the awesome realization that you live in an open air prison and then have to deal with that. You know, once you see that, you have a whole lot of thought that's going to go on in your head. I just know it. It did for me. It does for anybody else that finally sees this stuff. It's like your head will just, that's real. I didn't believe that that was real, but it, there it is. That's real. John Whitehead goes and talks about patriotism, the misplaced myth, that and the other. I agree with all that. You can do all that. You can talk about it all. The reality is you look at your local government, It's uh, you think it's supposed to sit there to uh, keep the peace, as I would say, underneath the law. That's their obligation, but they don't, do they? They went from keeping the peace to law enforcement. Well, what's the law? Well, it's policy. Go look at any any state statute. Go look at the laws of the United States. Some are policy and some are, are law. The law actually attaches to grounded uh, foundational obligations and duties. All the rest is this big policy consideration. But it acts as law. Like your money acts as money. It's all consistent. I keep t- I've told you this all for years. So the realization by many people now, I guess this in the last week or two, well, heck, you, this is real, that the, the police have no duty to protect you, notwithstanding what they say. It's just exposure to the lie. And you better come to terms with that. It doesn't mean you go out and go 
railing against them with a sign out in the street. It means you have to rethink your condition in this battlefield, essentially. And so I saw the first sentences of this article, and I said, he's just going to promote his book at the end. And sure enough, he promotes his book at the end. Because he frames it in the police state in America battlefield. He, pre- he pre- presents the beginning to be the promotion at the end. Partly why I don't underst- I don't like some of this. Uh, partly why I'm a little bit averse to what he brings up. But totally consistent with the I d- being able to get us closer to the deeper truth that I've been trying to tell you about to be- understand the condition. There's a reason why you can't rely on what you see. There's a reason why I tell you how to re- how to respond to these things. They are dictated to me to tell you by the nature of the foundation of the law or oppression from which they are created. And I told you the foundation for me in that was international law. How I started there, I'll never tell you. That's the that's the inspiration. That's the inspiration that comes to you when you finally dedicate yourself. You're directed where you need to go, and then it's up to you to keep it true. Not truth, just keep it true for you. So let me go through this thing about the police, if you had any idea. And, I, and I'm and i going to get to a spot because it creates a um, it creates a secondary proof for why you, you don't live where you think you live. You ought to live there. And we were told to keep us ourselves living there, but we didn't. And here's all, you know, here's the proof of how this all works. And from these things, lots of the oppression that we, administrative oppression devolves from a lot of this. And until you truly understand and see this, you think what I'm telling you is just so much opinion or a good idea or sounds right to you or just the next thought that you can impose your thoughts on what I say, do it your way instead of what I'm saying. And this is what another, I notice a lot of people do, you'll hear what I'm saying, but you don't understand how to apply it. You just interject yourself over the top of what I'm saying. And a lot of times I just have to not, not respond because there's so much to try to untie there that it just would take too long. And I, as I've said before, I can untie that in a matter. Well, it takes a few hours, but I can untie that pretty quickly when you have a problem. When you got the monkey on your back, I can untie all your misgivings pretty quickly. But it, now you're focused. See, that's the that's the thing. When you have to deal with with your problem, and I'm sitting there to show you how your perception was wrong, how you need to change it, and where that change needs to happen, we commit your own praxis to your own ignorance of a condition as you. You may have rightfully thought you were correct, but you find out real quickly that you're not. You won't have an argument with me in the last moment. When you're on the last, when you're on the two inch line of your own, of your own, uh, own goal line, and you got one play to do, one left play left, pretty soon you start paying attention. Is the kind of, um, the kind of attention you need to, to listen to me with. Uh, because if you were listening to, really listening without interjecting on me, what you think it is, you'd see this a lot clearer. But uh, let me move on to, where the Supreme Court, not but 2005, not 19, not the 1990s. We keep going back, and we can go and find the re- resources. And I'll have some links for you if you want to do some re- back research study. Another report, though, just from the New York Times: Justice rule, police do not have constitutional duty to protect someone. Well, that was the story that they talked about in the article to show you that the article's there. And what was interesting about this one is, but the majority on Monday saw little difference between the earlier case and this one. Castle Rock versus uh, Gonzalez. Mrs. Gonzalez did not have a property interest in enforcing the restraining order. Justice Scalia said, adding that such a right would not, of course, resemble any traditional conception of property. If you don't think property is important regarding the action of the government. And remember what the, li- what the limitation in Libra Code was. It was that they have to be cognizant of the property not to destroy it, and they have to pay compensation when they do. If you cannot describe a property interest, even an interest, I'm saying the property's there, but you do not have the right to move against these people. And the only place I've read that limitation is in the Libra Code. So you you put that, you reason what that might mean if you deny everything else. You reason what I've been telling you about property, why it's so important to focus on these things. Not as a question and not as a thing that you're going to wave a flag on, but what you assert up front. You identify it, absurd it, and you come right at these guys, right between the eyes. Although the protective order did mandate an arrest, and an arrest warrant is so many, in so many words, Justice Scalia said, a well-established tradition of police discretion has long coexisted 
with apparently mandatory arrest statutes. Now we're into police discretion. Where'd you hear that? But in the Libra Code. And I'm not saying that's the originating document. I'm saying that's an objective basis that pre-exists all of this nonsense long time ago that gave us the guidelines if we were paying attention. That the Supreme Court is paying attention to. Now we got discretion. Where's that? That's subjective, isn't it? And then they have their own little rules on how they apply it. And what? And, if, and now we come down to the day when we start hearing now the fact of it. If they say the magic words, they've been within their discretion. They have immunity. But where's immunity in the Constitution? And when you don't see it in the Constitution, maybe you're not under it. Pretty simple. You need to read the read these stories and show and and, and, exa- and understand. They referred to a case before uh, before the the uh, ca- in the Castle Rock. These cases go back. It's been so long. Most of us were uh, born into this decision that today we're coming uh, in the 2018, just realizing that the government has no duty to protect you. It has no duty to protect you. Doesn't then Title 50 make more sense and? They can make any decision to do whatever in their interest to secure them. You need to think deeply on this, how this reasoning works out. It may not be the only reasoning, but it certainly is one that you have to not disregard and not impose what you thought the world was like when these people are telling you different. Whether you agree with this or not, this is how you're going to be treated with by these people. Just dial 911, the myth of police protection, written in 1999. Underlying all gun control ideology is the one belief private citizens don't need firearms because police will protect them from crime. That belief is both false and dangerous for two reasons. This was written by Richard Stevens, a lawyer in Washington, D.C., and the author of Dial 911 and Die. The fir- first, the police cannot and do not protect everyone from crime. Second, the government and the police is most lo- in lo- most localities owe no legal duty to protect individuals from criminal attack. And I want you to remember that because there's a case I'm going to bring up and read part from that shows you where the states will put you in a condition that you are the victim. They have no duty to protect you from criminal attack. And then they take away the means of your defense. I want you to put, the, I'm saying that now early. I want you to just put that in the back of your mind. And if you don't understand how, what this condition, this occupying condition is and who, who's who been running the show, not who, but how they've been running the show, uh, if you try to interject your thoughts over what I say or think you're thinking like I've been saying, and then you come down the road, to now realize what I've been saying, uh, then someone else tells you that this is what I've been saying is the truth. You've delayed your, your awareness all that time. So I ask you, you do have to do the study, but do it. And you do have to prove me wrong, because I don't think I am. In any in any great way, in any any effectual way. Uh, maybe a little bit, I don't know. I don't have anybody like, address that. No, I, just get, I just get the blatherers, the... That have no, I could just tell that you have no clue with those that come at me like that. Okay, let me read back on this. When it comes to deterring crime and defending against criminals, individuals are ultimately responsible for themselves and their loved ones. Depending on, solely on police emergency response means relying on the telephone as the only defensive tool. Too often, citizens in trouble dial 911 and die. Statistics confirm the obvious truth that in the police in America cannot prevent violent crime. He goes through a bunch of numbers. I don't want to read all that. Uh, he goes and talks about how uh, the government's not there. I've told you before, you all know this, the cops come and take a report. Deal with the body and, and take a report. And practically speaking, it makes little sense to disarm the innocent victims while the criminals are armed. It is especially silly to disarm the victims uh, when too often the police are simply unable to protect them. Police do very little to prevent violent crime. We investigate crime after the fact, stated by Richard Mack, former sheriff of Graham County, Arizona. You may know him in the Patriot Circles. He was telling us a little bit of the truth of it. Wherever he went, I don't know. They got their own squabble going. Everyone gets a squabble, it seems. But the point is, there's the the truth sitting right there. 
Americans increasingly believe, however, that all they need to do for protection is, is a dial 911 and the police, the fire, and the ambulance will come straight to the rescue. It's faster than Pizza Man. Faith in the telephone number and local cops is so strong that Americans dial 911 over 250,000 times per day. And this gentleman doesn't talk about the fact that that's UN-inspired 911. Enhanced 911 is even more tied into the international order. Did you know that? I talked about it before. No one seems to hear me. Memory hole stuff, I guess, just washes under that bridge. You start keeping this in your mind, you start tying it together. It's hard to come to a different conclusion based on this set of facts. The article goes on to be headed off, have a heading of no duty to protect. It's not just that the police cannot protect you. They don't even have to come when you call. In most states, the government and the police owe no legal duty to protect individual citizens from criminal attack. The District of Columbia's highest court spelled out plainly the, quote, fundamental principle that a government and its agents are under no general duty to protect, provide public services such as police protection to any particular individual, close quote. In the especially gruesome landmark case of no duty rule got ugly, just before dawn of March 16, 1975, two men broke down the back door of a three-story home in Washington, D.C., shared by three women and a child. On the second floor, one woman was sexually attacked her housemates on the third level heard screams and called police. The first woman's, uh, the foreman's first calls to D.C. police got assigned to low pri- a low priority, so the responding officers arrived at the house, got no answer to the doors they knocked on, and did a quick check around and left. When the woman frantically called the police a second time, the dispatcher promised help would come, but no officers were uh, even dispatched. Now, I want you to understand here, as I said before, you're a victim. And then the government, who offers no guarantee to protection, takes away your ability to protect yourself. And that's okay. If you think that this world, this America that we have is so great, I want you to reconsider this in real. Take it inside and understand. I'm not telling you jokes. I wish I could. I'm not telling you jokes here. And I'm not talking just to waste my breath. These people come around. And they don't, they give you this this glow this this presentation like they're here to protect you, and the court cases. Now we're back to 1975, and it gets before this. So keep going. We're gonna keep going. And I want to show you something in one of the prior cases, one of the beginning cases that start to explain this to us. And but to understand that's also after 1954 as well. Another case and 1938 as well. The attackers kidnapped, robbed, raped, and beat all three women over 14 hours. When these women later sued the city and its police for negligently failing to protect them or even able to answer their second call, the court held the government had no duty to respond to the to their call to protect them. Case dismissed. Uh, you can read more. This article goes on and on. You need to see it. You need to see it in all its horrific uh, truth and glory. Uh, goes on and on, naming lots of cases. So. I'm going to go and pick, take one of those cases, or maybe not one of those cases. Um, one that I found, I, I was thinking I had seen this discussion back in the 90s, but I, you know, again, memory hole stuff even for me, I, I didn't keep all this stuff. I just was looking at what am I dealing with here, finding out these were the truths. You're imposed upon by these guys with discretion, these cops that have discretion, and they owe no duty, and yet they're there in your face. They certainly have a duty to bring revenue into the state, don't they? It sure seems like it, because they're law enforcers and not peace officers anymore. Another story that highlights more articles from the from that 1999 article was a PDF I found uh, uh, that speaks even to more. And this is where I see more cases. These have highlight and bolded PDF. I don't have. I can't describe it to you. You can get it in the blogcaster links. Uh, that this now highlights more cases. And so that got me into thinking, oh, maybe I can research for the earlier case than even 75 or even before the ones that I didn't under, I didn't remember. I found another story. Police have no duty to protect individuals. Now, remember, the word individuals is even tainted here. Let's just, let's just say you, the listener, not the legal status. That commerce entity, that legal entity individual, not a corporation. How's that? See how they did that? You can't even use the word individual. Anyway, the titles do. I want you to see through that. Because we're looking at the point that there is no governmental duty to protect you. 
It's to protect the public. That's the, that's the government. And you see that again in the Libra Code. They secure themselves. And when you see that, it says number one, when you see that, you know you're in that condition. You know them when you see them. Article one of the Libra Code. You don't have to profess themselves to be the military occupation. You just knows it when you see it. Indeed, indeed. Self-reliance for self-defense, police protection isn't enough, was the article, a subtext. All of our lives, especially during our younger years, we hear that the police are there to protect us from the very first kindergarten class visiting of Officer Friendly, that was a program, a propaganda program, to the very last time we saw a police car, most of which have the protect and serve emblazoned on the doors, we're encouraged to give ourselves over to police protection. But it hasn't always been that way. So before the mid-1800s, American and British citizens, even in large cities, were expected to protect themselves and each other. Indeed, they were legally required to pursue an attempt to apprehend criminals. The notion of police force in those days was abhorrent in England and America, where liberals viewed it as a form of dreaded standing army. Right now, I've been telling you, we have this standing army that's been fortified by the U.S. military as a standing army. You use your uh, state, so-called National Guard, as a standing army, and I hear crickets. You don't uh, believe me when I'm telling you the police don't aren't there to serve you. Uh, they'll serve you up, but they're not to serve you. And there's no obligation. This is not even a question in the law. England's first police force in London was not instituted until 1827. That's an interesting time relative to the historical adjustments that were going on right after 1900s, and we see the fruition of all that through 1913 into 1930, uh, 1932 and the Great Depression era. In 1938, a whole set of laws gets changed over, and by 1946, you're in an administrative condition. The problem is the war was declared against you back in Lincoln's time. He was a lawyer, remember? Just a lawyer. Uh, the first such forces in America followed in New York, Boston, Philadelphia during the period from 1835 and 1845. They were established only to augment citizen self-protection. It was never intended to act affirmatively prior to or during criminal activity or violence against individual citizens. Their duty was to protect society as a whole by deterrence, i.e., by systematically patrolling, detecting, or apprehending criminals after the occurrence of crimes. There was no thought of police displacing citizens' right of self-protection, nor could they, even if it were intended. So there's been a big shift. We've now handed all the power we're supposed to keep to ourselves over to the government. And they took it. And they took it in the way that governments only know how to, by a military force. Remember, the Constitution shows military being established within the federal government. That's all it has. Remember? I don't know why this is a big question, but it, apparently it has been. Well, that's where I thought about it. And uh, not not to point it out, I, one of our broadcast hosts on uh, on um, a Real Liberty Media, I think, was also found, made a comment. I don't know the source of it, but that's why another peak. I had this on my tabs, and that, that peaked up too. Some, some of our own hosts are uh, kind of astonished about this point. Uh, and I'm surprised about that, but that's neither here nor there. There's there's truths right in front of us that we just it's just under our radar for whatever reason that I've been tempting to try and bring on top. It's not under the radar. It's not transparent to us. It sets a whole other sets a whole other table, if you will. If you're going to eat at this table, then maybe you want to maybe than what you ordered up or thought you, someone ordered up. Uh, again, this article can go on and on. Uh, information that you actually need. Here's another tons and tons of links to court cases and stories and reports of the courts coming in to explain over and over and over that the government has no duty notwithstanding what they tell you. And I, I just as it's occurred, someone told me here recently there's going to be a sheriff's runoff in a county near me and the, and the candidate uh, that's going to uh, attempt to over, overthrow the incumbent says the sheriff's department is a business and it has to be run like a business. Should tell you tons. And there's a proof for that. And so he's not telling you a lie either. But I don't think everybody understands what he just said. 
And that's exactly the problem. They're a private entity that's run like a business, is a business, runs like a business, and they're out there just doing what? Imposing themselves. And so my, my first thought, and I'm sure it's been a couple of other people's first thought, well, if it's a private business and they're just imposing themselves, then I have the right of being free from interference. Can I just tell you to go away? Well, there's a clue there. You can. But will they? That's the criminal. Now, I tell you, you see that, you better develop a word in your mouth on how to construct your record to get, get that out and to uh, counter these, these military officers. That's about the only thing you have. Because I don't think anybody with any brains would say, well, at that point, I guess I get to bring out my weaponry and I can ta alter and abolish that government agent as I see fit. You know, that ain't going to work. Uh, lunacy. So you're not living underneath that Constitution or its guidances. And this story, these reports will tell you how long ago that got taken away. And I'm telling you about the causes before that. And the guidance is in the Libra Code. And you can just directly apply it to this condition. Uh, going. This report goes on, talks about a case called Warren uh, versus District of Columbia. Even that was too soon for me. So what do I do is I go check and I found a case. It's not even the oldest one I thought that I, I knew. I didn't have that much time. And I want you to um, get the link and read this case. But in particular, I want to read a part. It was a dissent by a judge. It was called the RISS, R-I-S-S, -S, versus the city of New York. And again, the city of New York is a very, very, very interesting place regarding all the imposition of legal coming from, it's emanating from here, this area, out into the nation. Uh, you, again, to keep all these historical facts together, you start to see other pictures being developed, other, other uh, uh, facts being developed that you reason with. You can come, you can bring stuff together to fortify, confirm your whys of the background, the foundation for how this develops. And the court in a dissent, let me see if I can find it, so I think it was Keating here, the judge, starts, I'm into the case. This is one of those cases that said that the, the government owes no duty. Here's a dissenting judge making a conversation. And I want, I'm using this because this was one of the styles of cases. I think this, I may have read this case a long, long time ago, but it came in a group of cases in a whole bunch. Oh, it's, it's, it's replete. You read all this stuff, you start seeing the anomaly. On the one hand, you're, you, there's no duty. On the other hand, they take away your abilities. This case, it's like it's a sadness that comes over me when I realize how duped we are about what we thought was going on. And this, this dissent touches on that very clearly. When she says here, this judge, no one questions the proposition that first duty of government is to assure its citizens the opportunity to live in personal security. And no one who reads the record of Linda, Linda Riss, Linda's ordeal can reach a conclusion other than the city of New York acting through its agents completely and negligently failed to fulfill this obligation to Linda. Now understand, the obligation to Linda was denounced by the majority of this case. So keep that out, but understand, I want to get to the point, this judge is saying there was an obligation to Linda under the state's representation. The judge goes on to write, Linda has turned to the courts of this state for redress, asking that the city be held liable in damages for its negligent failure to protect her from harm. With compelling logic, she can point out that if a stranger, who had absolutely no obligation to her aid her, had offered her assistance, and thereafter Barton Pugash was able to injure her as a result of the negligence of the volunteer, the courts would certainly require him to pay damages. Citing Restatement of Torts, second, two, uh, Section 323. Why then would the city, whose duties are imposed by law and include the prevention of crime, New York City Chapter Section 435, and, consequently, extend far beyond that of the Good Samaritan, not be responsible? If a private detective acts carelessly, no one could deny that a jury could find such conduct unacceptable. Why then is the city not required to live up to at least the same minimum standards and professional professional competence, not incompetence, professional competence, which would be demanded of a private detective? Linda's reasoning seems so eminently sensible that surely it must come as a shock to hear and to every citizen to hear the city argue to learn that this court decides that the city has no duty to provide police protection to any given individual. What makes the city's proposition particularly difficult to understand is that in conformity 
with the dictates of law, Linda did not carry any weapon for self-defense. Citing formal penal law, section 1897, section 1897, thus, by a rather bitter irony, she was required to rely for protection on the city of New York, which now denies all responsibility to her. It is not a distortion to summarize the essence of the city's case here in the following language. Because we owe a duty to everyone, everybody, we owe it to nobody. Were it not for the fact that this position has been hollowed, has been hollowed by much ancient and revered precedent, we would surely dismiss it as preposterous. To say there is no duty is, of course, to start with the conclusion. The question is whether or not there should be liability for negligent failure to provide adequate police protection. I'll end there. You can read it when you get the link or have it uh, when you go search out. Let me go back up to the fact that this is a if question by this judge. I'm telling you there is no such condition that she was anticipating applicable to people. This is only applicable to, it's not even the sovereign. It's applicable to an oppressor, a, a conqueror, an occupying force. If we applied normal stuff, these people couldn't do this. But we can't apply normal things. We also know that we can impose upon the captors of our occupation the ability that they cannot protect themselves and therefore is not able to protect themselves when we do not fulfill what their expectation is that we promoted in them, that we could protect them, is something that should terrify you. If you haven't understood this, you haven't understood this dynamic, I don't know how you can critically think about the world around you at this point. When you come to terms with the totally incongruous condition, when you finally start to make sense of it, you're going to, I'm sure, have to come into, the, into conformity with more of what I've been saying, if not exactly. Or you will, please, find the other source that would be reasonable to come to, to terms to come to what the condition is I need to see that myself because I, I need to get off of this, this thing that looks like a vast truth to me. But this is from 1958. And they're talking about ancient precedent. Why, I'm astonished that Whitehead says the last one was 2005. It's totally dismissing this whole condition of the world, folks. Just to keep expanding it back. I keep telling you, this thing gets deeper and wider and no matter how far you go. And it's not a pretty picture. It, I told you at times it's really devastating to actually start to to talk to to think about this very deeply. Uh, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. When I read it and realized, it, as I describe it here, it's a, it's other things, but this one it's the it's the uh, manual of your of your your defects, and someone knows that and they can exploit that. When that settled in me deeply, it just it just devastated me for about four days. But I rise up. Notwithstanding that, there was no insight. With that new that new awareness, I could now put that equa that part in the equation of my uh, my analysis of the reality that I and we are in. And I guess as I think about, that's why I have a, maybe not much tolerance for those that are in positions like a John Whitehead, who's an attorney who can see it, who can actually say all this stuff is there, tell you about it, which is the great thing, but not actually move forward to empower you, maybe better than me. But not at all? Just to tell you a story? Just to sell a book? Just to keep you stuck in the oppression that you're in? That, I guess, is the underlying problem for me with all this stuff. Most all this stuff. Oh, you can do your documentary. Keep talking about it, folks. Even if you're 100% right, you're not going to do it right. And so that's my problem. Let me get back to the point. They disarm you and enable you and disable you, and that's still okay. Should be uh, frightening to those of you that believe there's a Second Amendment right. And what goes on with all this behind the scenes of how they manipulate you out of this thing, that, this idea that you have this right, that it does anything is the other problem. It could do something, but as I've told you, that's the last answer. That's the last answer. And there's no, there's no determination of the outcome. And if we have one example in history in the United States of America where people did do that, Lincoln resolved that against us. 
back to Libra code again. I can't, I can't get back around here. And what eventuates outside of that is there's no duty in the military to, to protect you. It will protect itself, and it can set up a condition that you are disabled because if you're disabled, then you're no threat to it, again, to the security of those that have no duty to you, that you have told yourself that they do. Total, talk about straw men. Fascinating thing what we do to ourselves. I did it myself. But somehow I got onto this. Well, I guess when you get five guns stuck in your face and they're gonna, and you don't know in the less next second if you're gonna exist, you become like all the other things we've heard since then. All the other people that died at the hand of stupid go- cops thinking that they had some protection that, that they needed to protect themselves. And I'm asking, where'd America go? This is not the America I was told. That's right. The stark reality was, I was just now seeing it for the first time. It wasn't the way we were told. That's where I start my journey to come to today. And so I get a little dismayed that I've been talking all these things and to hear handfuls and handfuls of people finally coming to terms with, it really is that the government doesn't have a, a protect, a no pro, duty to protect you. No duty and obligation. Think about that. I talk to you all the time. You've got to find a duty and obligation before you get a handle on them. Well, if they have no duty and obligation, how do you get a handle on them? Ah, that's an interesting question. Neat puzzle trick, and it's possible. If you listen very carefully to the last judge, they actually bring up a a doctrine that's developed. It's the special relationship doctrine. Now, I use it a little bit differently. I don't speak to it. I just use it. I can't get into it because it's a matter of factual, it's a factual presentation. What you establish is fact that you can use. Essentially, it is you have, and it's not actually dealt with as far as the doctrine that you create a special agreement with the cops that they essentially undertake, undertake to protect you. Well, there's a different way to do that in that they weren't supposed to attack you. Remember, these uh, free uh, freedom of association and freedom from association, there's also this duty that they have to do certain things by commission or omission. I talk about all this stuff all the time. You have to figure out in this set of circumstances where they can disarm you and that be okay and have someone else attack you and that be okay when they don't come to help. You have to stick yourself in that environment and say, how am I going to prevail anyway? In the initiation of that problem, you cannot go to other things. In other words, let's say the law that disarmed you may be invalid. Did you go attack that first? Did you look at the consequences that they've established against you, the, the battlefield they've put against you that looks like it's law that may not be so? That's presumed only. Everything is only policy, only presumption at its best. I tell you to argue at the property side, and there's no ability for the occupier to violate it. That's getting them out in a different way. The special relationship is their duty to uphold the law. They promise to do it through their contract. Not yours. I keep saying, look through the statutes as their guidance, uh, what they were supposed to do. I got a lot of that from this type of a a story here, where you see that the cops have no duty to protect you, and then they disarm you, and you have no no your victim. Then how do you combat that? That's where my thoughts come from. Is stories the stories? These are case law precedents. Longer than most of us have uh, been uh, cognizant of capacity, of any capacity, they're listening to me. Some got close. Some had capacity right about this time, but many didn't. So then we hear, and we wonder why the next, uh, we hear this disarming condition, how they can do this and why, oh, we got a Second Amendment right, (laughs) and you you guys don't even pay attention. You just stand on these words without even understanding the condition. In light of, the, of this case alone, saying you can be disarmed in face of a lack of, 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 of duty to protect you, and the criminal, the third-party stakeholder can come in and beat you down, kill you, hurt you, whatever, and that's okay. Don't you hear Title 50 written all over this? Is the EPA giving you fluoride? I mean, it's just, uh, I don't see the distinction here, but it just, uh, it's just the tool, the weapon they use against you. That the court's saying that they don't have any duty to protect you, and they can let harm befall you. It's Title 50 and the exceptions to the government. But what is that? That's the war, but that's the war department statutes. So we hear that people are surprised about this. I don't know. A guy comes out promoting Democrats and, and then gets elected as a president. Trump tells lawmakers he will outlaw bump stocks quickly. Well, my point's not even on all that either when I get to this point. The bump stocks is that, is that stock that's on the rifle that uses the uh, ejection, um, uh, the, ca- the pushback from the uh, expulsion of the projectile to push on a stock to give you re- recoil, 
uh, re, re, uh, return on the trigger. You just hold your, your finger over the trigger and the bump stock moves back and forth under the, the, the bullet coming out. And it makes you, it lets you pull that trigger way faster because it's just a response to the projectile coming out and the kickback of the gun, the inertia going back. That makes it more automatic. It's not automatic. It just makes it function like it is. Bullets come out as fast as the, as you tune the pressure between the, uh, the press pushback and the, and the pressure on the stock. That's what they claim in this Florida thing is what happened. Now, I haven't seen any, any proof of any of this. But Trump comes out and says that bump stocks will be outlawed. And this got a whole bunch of discussion over, you know, well, why don't you just outlaw the cars that drunks drive and all this other nonsense that comes out. The point is, is I think we're missing the big deal. Why are they even talking about this? The Second Amendment, if it was actually relevant, says shall not be infringed, keep him bare. No, there's no registration requirements. But you see, the, the, the courts have come in to explain to you something else. That they can make you vic- a victim and they have no duty to protect you. The only condition I know that the proof of that is sits in the Libra Code, that condition. So, he wants to immediately outlaw bump stocks. What's well, interfering with your right to bear arms and the type of arm? For what? For what? Deer hunting? No. It was to protect yourself against the very government making these rules that Trump is on board with to dis- disarm you and de- disaffect you in that capacity, even if it is the last capacity. I wrote a Twitter against this. I want to remind you all. I just put these things up on the Twitter just to kind of remind me. Actually, I'm using them right now. Uh, I, I claim, I, I made this statement, shall not be infringed, infringed without due process. Let's think about that if we must. And see the 2010 murder memo, extrajudicial executive expedience is what it relies on. I've talked to you all about this, and when did I report on that, 2012 or so? He wants to get rid of bump stocks. He also goes on and talks about... Uh, making uh, new rules for how you're supposed to get a gun. And he said he wants to take out if anybody, he wants the guns be taken from you before you've been, uh, due process has been given to you to prove that you shouldn't have a gun, if, the, I mean, given the new rules that we have to live under. And I say, how do you have, how are you not violated that uh, to take away the due process and rely on due process this after the fact? That's a violation of a prohibition, and that's an even worse violation than violating the patent uh, grant stuff. If all of y'all would just kind of lay that out for yourself, but that condition is is even thought about should should bother you. But what but what is it? it it's this condition. We can we can make you we can make you uh, disarm you and let a third party harm you, and we have no duty to that. Our only duty is to ourselves. And another propaganda piece that popped up. Another thing that goes on all around, all around this gun thing in 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 in, um, in the Florida. And I'm going to get to something here that I've talked about before too, and I mentioned it already in the past. I mentioned the stakeholder thing, right? This all comes to fruition. How this works, and it's all the it's all the spaghetti western we live in. But Feinstein can't contain her glee in gun control meeting with Trump. It was a meeting. Uh, apparent, apparently, it was the uh, the the first maybe it was the first reality show uh, episode i can't quite tell but trump says he wants senator feinstein's gun control provisions in her bill to be impo- be put in part of the one that's being proposed right now because of florida and all this outrage that came and all these students that were eating tide pods last week and now they're doing uh, gun policy gun control policy this week completely oblivious to the prohibition and everybody seems to be, even though, but it's in spirit in the Patriots who don't know what the heck's going on. But uh, she, this comes out in the news, of first, I think it was the first reality reality show uh, episode, uh, that Feinstein gets all giddy over Trump saying, I'm going to put, I want your, your provisions put in this bill. Well, I think that's all political gamemanship. So she gets all giddy. Uh, Trump says he's working together bipartisan. It's going to go through the process. That's going to be all cut back out. All right. The problem is they're doing gun control stuff. Um, but look very carefully on the on the parts of it. They can only touch certain parts they think, and I don't think that's been challenged as well. So my response to this thing where Trump says using Florida regarding uh, now bump stocks and going to put uh, Feinstein's thing, my observation on all this is and I wrote this to Trump through Twitter, which means it won't go anywhere, but there I did it anyway. Stop scapegoating guns for government causes and blaming the innocent, Donald Trump. How about making sure the findings in this report are impeccably implemented before infringing that which shall not be infringed? We'll talk then.
hashtag stop government inflicted wounds. The link I give is to a document by the Secret Service that explains how you stop and what the method, the things that you have to look for to stop uh, school shootings. Done in like 2000. So when you see this stuff going on and they're doing this machinations in front of you over the control, making you a victim, withstanding your rights, you realize you're not in a constitutional republic. I submit you're looking at a military consequence and Trump is part of that, that group. However, he gets there, whatever his concept is, that's how it's working. They won't look to solve the real problem. They're just going to get, make more work to it, uh, pr propose or to uh, to bring and realize the agenda, the global agenda, essentially. And so, what do we hear? We hear the we hear the bre the crack in the porcelain of the prohibition against uh, interfering with keeping and bearing. Florida Senate revokes two-year ban on AR-15s uh, minutes after it passes. Dangerous games play stupid games with stupid prizes. Florida, based on this thing in, in, in uh, Florida, this, this school shooting, whatever it was, doesn't matter to me, what, this is what they're using. Uh, they have now made a gun control uh, issue. It could have been a joke, I don't know. But I'll tell you what, folks, they're 21 to 17 was the vote. It's not this joke is going to turn to permanence about this over what? Over what is all this over? And then this little article pops up as a question. Why did it take two weeks to reveal Parkland students astroturfing? Now, I don't know why they use this term. This is just another one that's popped up. Like, astroturfing is a cause. Someone that's not a part of the cause using somebody else in order to advance their cause through the ones they're using. What have I talked to you about the stalking horse? If you didn't notice this uh, gun activity, this anti-gun activity that came up, and didn't think that there was an organization, here's the story that's going to point to you. What you saw after the Parkland shooting to advance this new control thing nationwide immediately was a plan. What I wanted to point out, they call it astroturfing. I call it the stalking horse. I talk, and remember, this is UN. So what did they use? What are they using? Again, it's consistent. They're using the children, aren't they? The children need protection to advance the knot in the barrel of your pistol. This promotion was too well oiled. They made a mistake. It went too well oiled. And someone actually caught it and wrote it down for you. That this is what I've been talking about. This is what the system does to dis diminish your capacity. This is what the military occupation does to not cause you to go to war with it. And I don't mean necessarily by guns, but by any manner. I mean, are, is it clear enough, folks, as how consistent this is all doing and you're being played? I don't hear many people talking about this stuff. It really astonishes me. And I think part of this is you don't really believe what I'm telling you is really deeply what, I'm, what I've been saying. And it, I don't really care what it, how, how long it takes you to get it. That when you get the point, you finally see it. But it, we, we are in the late days, it seems. This is, uh, the 21 to 17 in Florida didn't mean much. It was a big joke, it seems. I think they were playing games. But it shows you how close this issue is and, and how how much the victim you will be are being played for and will be, and the courts have already allowed us back in 1958, that that's quite fine. And the government has no obligation to any one of you, none of you, just to promote itself and its, its things. And it's a global thing that's been going on. Thank you for tuning in today. I hope something I said uh, gets, you, gets you more aware of what's going on and maybe gets you activated. Put you in some deep thought, get some re reconsideration going on. Thank you, Grimner, for what you do at reallibertymedia.com. Uh, folks, donate. Uh, I think we met, we just met, met the requirements this, this, this year, and maybe a little bit more would be helpful. Uh, Jules at ULCY.TV, thank you very much. And uh, Mines and um, BitChute, thank you. Appreciate all that, uh, that uh, support and the sharing and all that reminding and all that goes on there. I'll be with you next week, Tech Diffs or Nature Willing. Well, that's another lesson. I hope with today's information you can take it to those that misbehave. From behind the woodshed, leaving his mark on the beast, this is Hal Anthony. Till next time, journey with purpose.
Well, that's what opening up a can of whoop-ass feels like. Son, you just opened a whole case of whoop-ass. 